It's genuinely hard to find a libertarian who does not love Lysander Spooner. I've met every kind of libertarian there is. The people who put their licenses in bags and hang them out the window for police officers when they get pulled over. The kind of libertarian who has a dream of fighting insurrectionary militia campaigns against the Federals. And the kinds of libertarians who even disavow their social security numbers and live off the grid with odd jobs as much as possible. But everyone, no matter what kind of libertarian you are, everyone loves Lysander Spooner. Historian Phil Magnus joins us again to talk about this most radical of libertarians. Welcome to Liberty Chronicles, a project of libertarianism.org. I'm Anthony Comegna. Lysander Spooner more or less seems to have led the archetypical libertarian life. Like I, it's, it's hard to imagine a real actual person who led much more of an archetypically libertarian life. So can you tell us a bit about his personal history? Yeah, yeah. so there's the uh, kind of the running joke. If there's ever a libertarian that wants to film a, a, a biopic about somebody in uh, libertarian history in the movement, Lysander Spooner is probably the ideal candidate of that. You could give a, uh, a really kind of a swashbuckling tale of someone who more or less waged war on the government for uh, a – 50, 60 year stretch of his life, uh, basically from the very origins of his entry into adulthood. Uh, it's almost the day he died. He's taking up anti-statist causes and he's doing so in, uh, in very creative and subversive ways. Uh, so Spooner is, um, uh, see, he's born on a farmhouse, in a farmhouse in, uh, in a central Massachusetts, uh, out of an old uh, Puritan family. Uh, we don't know too much about his childhood other than uh, he, he, he's left a little bit of glimpses of autobiographical material from time to time. Um, but what happens with Spooner is he, he comes under the tutelage of a pair of attorneys that try to raise him up through the law. I give him instruction basically through the old apprenticeship system, the way that uh, legal training used to be. And uh, this is really the font of his first encounter with the state. The state of Massachusetts at the time had, had started passing uh, a variety of regulations and licensing schemes of uh, if you wanted to practice law, uh, you basically needed to, uh, to to go through a bunch of regulatory fulfillment um, as distinct from this older uh, common law tradition of you uh, uh, you go and apprentice effectively with a, uh, a barred attorney. Uh, so Spooner is encouraged by um, his two tutors that he's working in their law office uh, to basically make a test case against the state of Massachusetts uh, very early in his life. This is uh, in the 1830s when he's uh, uh, active in this campaign uh, to, to, to essentially force his way into the legal profession without going through the regulatory hurdles that the state of Massachusetts had put up. So one of his first pamphlets is on this subject. And uh, he effectively gets the state to stand down and admit him into the bar, um, into the courtroom. So that's kind of the very first uh, font of Spooner's activism. And what we see from there is him taking up cause after cause after cause of uh, uh, basically railing against what he sees as injustices in law that are imposed by the government. Uh, and these can be some very small things. We, uh, he thinks that government is the... Uh, uh, the font of monopoly in society. His uh, his next big crusade, for example, he goes into uh, uh, trying to free the the postage system and introduce competition to it. Uh, the big one that he's most famous for, which we can get into, is uh, working in the abolitionist movement as a, a radical anti-slavery man, and he champions this cause for a good 20 years of his life. Uh, and then what we find is after the Civil War, after slavery is abolished, uh, he turns to various other economic causes, but it's a similar theme. He sees uh, state monopoly of property or state monopoly of money or state monopoly of the legal system as uh, uh, the, the mechanisms that introduce uh, injustice and uh, appropriation of wealth into society. Uh, so he continues for the rest of his life as basically a crus crusader against these different causes. Um, in a very archetypical uh, libertarian way. 
Now, I want to go back to those two threads you mentioned about the post office and abolitionism, and I want to see if we can tie them together in his biography at all. Because <clears throat> as, as you know, the uh, post office was an early focal point of abolitionist uh, uh, campaigns of all different sorts and backlash against abolitionism. So there was this, especially the uh, incident in South Carolina in 1835 when the Charleston mob burned all the abolitionist males and that touched off William Leggett's conversion to abolitionism among others after him. Um, there were figures like Barnabas Bates who was a loco foco contemporary of Spooner who was trying to do the same thing by reforming the males. Uh, his his big cause was to get postage rates down as far as possible and um, he wanted to do that with competition of many different kinds, reform of the postal system. Um, and his purpose, Barnabas Bates's purpose behind that was to make it easier for abolitionists to use the mail and flood the mails with their material uh, for a very cheap uh, rate. I wonder, is there any connection that you can find between Spooner's post office or postal activism um, against that monopoly and uh, tie it to his abolitionism in any way? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Spooner is famous for leading a crusade against the, the post office. This is his next major cause he takes up after he's broken into the legal system. And what he does is um, in the early 1840s, he founds a company uh, called the American Letter Mail Company. And it's best to think of this as kind of like a 19th century FedEx. And what they did is he, they set up station offices in all the major cities along the East Coast. So uh, you could go to the uh, American Letter Mail Company in Boston, you purchase a stamp, put it on your package, and there would be a carrier that uh, every week would travel up uh, up and down the coast, uh, dropping off that package from office to office. So the Boston office would carry to New York, uh, pick up new packages, drop off packages down for New York, move further down to Philadelphia, down to Washington, D.C., all the way down to Charleston, at least was the idea uh, behind the scheme. And the historical literature on this has focused on the market mechanism behind it. So postage rates are very high through uh, the federal government, and Spooner views this as his entry uh, mechanism. He says, I can do this for cheaper than the federal government does, so I'm going to sell my booklet of stamps cheaper than what uh, the federal government does to deliver mail along the same route, and we'll just do it through this distribution system of, uh, of stationing offices and have a carrier move between them, and we can outcompete them, and that will force through the competitive mechanisms the federal government to lower its postage rate. Uh, so he gets a lot of credit for that story, sometimes cited as the father of cheap postage in the United States. But the other context to it is the one that you mentioned. So in the 1830s, uh, Andrew Jackson in particular really comes to champion this cause of viewing regulatory mechanisms over the post office as a means of, uh, of keeping down what they'd call insurrectionary uh, devices. And insurrection really means abolitionist literature, uh, literature that could incite uh, either the slaves to revolt or incite other people in the South to push back against this institution. And there are a number of famous incidents. Like you, you mentioned the one in Charleston uh, where uh, you know, mobs basically seize and burn and destroy abolitionist pamphleteering that's sent through the U.S. postage system to the South. Uh, this causes a national uh, emergency of sorts in Congress. There's legislation propo proposed to uh, suppress the sending of seditious literature through the, uh, through the federal postage system um, on account that it could foment a slave revolt. Uh, so abolitionists had seized onto this tactic as, uh, uh, as a way to get their message out as you mail newspapers and pamphlets and letters at random, basically to any uh, uh, name and identity that would exist in the uh, the postage books uh, across the South, and it, uh, it's kind of like a mass mailing campaign, a political campaign today, where uh, throwing as much literature as you can into the mail. That's how you get your message out. Well, this is seen as a threat to the slavery system, so uh, both state and federal officials start to clamp down on this through this ostensible public service of the post office. Uh, they start using it as a censorship mechanism. And Spooner absolutely sees this. He mentions it in his pamphlets that uh, there's a threat to free speech at play 
with the way that uh, the post office operates and censors its, its material. So not only is he structuring the American Letter Mail Company as an economic competitor to the post office to, to, to push uh, rates down, he also sees it as something that's willing to carry literature that's uh, legally suppressed through this government-run alternative. Uh, so that sub subversion is automatically at play in his entire scheme, and it gets into a uh, almost a direct foray into his next big cause, which is abolitionism. Uh, and, you know, I think historians probably know Spooner best as somebody who said that slavery is necessarily unconstitutional. It's against the, the spirit and nature of the Constitution because it denies individual sovereignty, um, which is, is against the natural law and so it cannot be proper constitutional law. Now, I don't want to dwell too much on that because like I said, I think pe that's what people best know Spooner for. But I'm way more interested in his radical, radical politics and uh, social activism and that to me is sort of a forgotten uh, element of the left libertarian past that, that people barely recognize or remember anymore today. Um, and you know the the main subject for today is the secret six of John Brown. Sure. <laughs> so let's let's march up to that point. Um, talking about his his early abolitionism, do we know exactly when he became an abolitionist, or was it sort of always part of his Massachusetts upbringing? Yeah, it, it seems to be there in the Massachusetts upbringing. It comes out of a Massachusetts legal tradition. So uh, this is something if you if you dig deep into the legal history, so. Not only is he uh, an anti-slavery man who's famous for uh, claiming that slavery is unconstitutional, and sometimes libertarians struggle with uh, with his reasoning here. Um, so um, I guess to, just to briefly set it out, his entire argument is that uh, slavery is on its face incompatible with something that's uh, that serves as a foundational document for uh, society, even if that document itself has. Uh, uh, he would call them indirect nods to slavery. So uh, the U.S. Constitution refers to slavery uh, at several places, but it never uses the word slave. It always refers to treatments of other persons uh, or uh, guarded language of that type. And Spooner sees that as, as intentional um, and kind of frames his argument on it, but he, but he also sees slavery as something that's inherently self-voiding of a legal system. So anti-slavery activism, in a way, is the font of his anarchism. Uh, the entire notion that a society could exist and sanction an institution that's in the violation of natural law, such as slavery, uh, would void the legitimacy of that society and void the legitimacy of that government. So uh, hence, anarchism becomes a, a default so long as, uh, as slavery is permitted to persist. Uh, although he does draw on an English legal tradition, and he cites this, uh, this thoroughly. So there's the famous Somerset case in uh, Great Britain of 1772, which kind of kickstarts the abolitionist movement around the world, especially in the British order. And it's a common law decision that rules. Uh, so there's a, a slave from Virginia that's carried into England and uh, by his owner on a trip overseas. And some local anti-slavery men basically file a writ of habeas corpus to, uh, to free the slave that's been brought into England. And they did so very creatively. They, they looked on the books and they noticed there's, there's nothing in the English constitutional order or system that establishes labor, uh, slavery as positive law. Uh, and the absence of that establishment means that by uh, legal definition, Somerset the slave is free to go. Well, this, uh, this tradition filters over into Massachusetts. Uh, so there's an Articles of Confederation era uh, legal decision uh, that comes out of Massachusetts prior to the Constitution taking place that voids slavery in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts on almost identical grounds to Somerset. They say, well, we never established this by law. The common law kicks in and the common law upholds a, a certain type of natural law that voids slavery's existence. So that's where sla slavery enters into uh, Spooner's legal tradition. He, uh, he draws out of that type of a um, uh, thinking. Uh, where it goes in the radical direction is uh, he sees it as such a fundamental violation of a natural law order that uh, it's almost a duty of an individual to resist it. It's almost a duty of anyone who values a free society to oppose any and all type of slavery everywhere. So it's a very universalistic uh, 
um, uh, form of anti-slavery activism, which gets him into quite a bit of tension with some of the other abolitionists who are arguing a more localized case-by-case -case approach or are arguing a, a, a containment policy, which is what we see in the Republican Party when it emerges uh, in the 1850s and 1860s. What is his relationship to the political parties and the many different factions of the period? Yeah. Uh, say from the – let's yeah, so go he, 1840s and 1850s. What are his affiliations? Yeah, he's an anti-party man uh, through and through. Uh, he actually kind of detests voting, uh, although he does have a, a fairly complex relationship with that. Uh, uh, the interesting connection that he has to political parties formally though – is his great book uh, on the un unconstitutionality of slavery is adopted by his friend Garrett Smith as a political platform. And Garrett Smith runs for uh, several political offices. He's a, uh, um, a Liberty Party, a third party candidate for president in uh, 1848, I believe, and then eventually gets himself elected to Congress in the 1850s. Um, and Smith is a similar old school radical New England abolitionist. He's based in New York. Uh, Smith is uh, personally wealthy, and he uses his uh, his family's wealth as basically to be a patron of anti-slavery causes and a patron of anti-slavery thinkers. And Spooner is one of those that comes into uh, uh, connection with him. Uh, so Smith is influenced by this doctrine, by this book. And even though Spooner himself is not saying, well, let's run a national political campaign on uh, – uh, the unconstitutionality of slavery, you have someone like Garrett Smith who is taking up that cause and saying, well, let's adapt, adapt it into our uh, our own political message and make this the platform on which we run. Uh, Smith is a better known figure than Spooner in the sense that uh, uh, he, he's a more visible, prominent abolitionist on the political scene of the United States for about 20 years. He's also one of the core members of the Secret Six and in a way becomes a patron of uh, Frederick Douglass at many points in his time. Uh, so there's another political dissemination of Spooner himself. Douglass undergoes a conversion in the late 1840s or early 1850s from uh, being a Garrisonian, someone who views the Constitution as a pact with slavery, to being a Spoonerite. And there are several speeches where, where Douglass says, uh, I've been convinced by uh, the eminent legal thinker Lysander Spooner that slavery is indeed incompatible with the Constitution, and that's what we build our political platform on. And by the end of the 1850s, Spooner publishes at least uh, two broadsides advocating that white northerners gang up together, arm themselves, invade the South, break the slaves' chains, free as many as possible. Uh, put the chains on the planters and chastise them until they give up slavery. Right. <laughs> right. So it's kind of like an, uh, an ordered slave revolt that, uh, that he's advocating. Uh, very much a radical uh, direction that he's moved in, but it's a philosophy of liberty that's underlining uh, both of them. He's uh, actually somewhat uh, similar to another uh, black abolitionist of this era, Henry Highland Garnett in his prescriptive approach. And Garnett is famous uh, as a free black northerner who uh, campaigns and crusades against slavery. He gives a speech in the 1840s uh, where he declares, let your motto be resistance, 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 resistance. And this is directed to the slaves of the South. And Garnett's message to them is uh, take your case to your master, plead that by natural right you are to be free. And if he frees you, he will be fulfilling his moral duty as a human being, uh, his moral recognition. If he doesn't free you, uh, he may strike you down. But if he does, resist that. And uh, let your spilled blood effectively be the, uh, uh, the, the tool of resistance. Uh, so it's a, it's a very uh, uh, you know, pessimistic outlook in the sense that uh, it's welcoming a slave revolt in play. But it's also a realistic outlook in saying that, you know, uh, uh, these people are not willing to negotiate to, uh, to leave their institution voluntarily. And Spooner is very much of that mindset. So in the 1850s, uh, 1858 is the big scheme. He authors a series of pamphlets and broadsides, and his intent is to mail them around the, company, uh, the country, 
to uh, uh, paper them across the South. One of them uh, actually has an appeal to the non-slave owners, the free whites of the South, uh, to join in the scheme. And he tries to use moral suasion to convince uh, everyone that receives this into believing that slavery is a wrong. And it's not only a wrong, but it's also their own individual moral duty to stand against that wrong. And uh, in so doing, through that intellectual moral uh, instruction that he's provided by his pamphlet, uh, to order and instigate a revolt that forcibly uh, unchains the slaves, that forcibly frees uh, the slaves off the plantation system and turns the institution around against their masters. But also uh, notice there's always that, uh, that appeal to human decency uh, to the masters to change their ways. Uh, so, you know, we'll shackle you um, in return uh, as a means of freeing our slaves, but uh, you can come over to the right side and, uh, you know, no harm felt. Uh, see the error of your ways and admit it and end this institution and uh, life will be good again. <laughs> you know, so it, it is a little bit utopian in that sense. Uh, this is very much a, a, a Spoonerite approach to uh, uh, to how to handle the slavery problem. As you can tell, this is a very, very radical uh, uh, solution. And there are other, not only Southerners that are horrified by uh, the fact that he's publishing these things, there are other abolitionists uh, that are saying, wait a minute, um, we want to achieve our, um, our anti-slavery goals through a very incremental, gradualist political approach rather than uh, just upheaval of the entire system. Uh, so they view this as kind of undermining their cause because it's too radical. Uh, the one person that doesn't, though, is John Brown. And that's where we get into Spooner's um, complex relationships with uh, that element of, uh, of actual slave revolt style abolitionism. Right. And now when, uh, you know, when I've been doing my reading in the period, I've seen some historians, very few, but some have mentioned Spooner directly as somebody involved in, in the Secret Six to some degree, although it's fairly uh, hazy as to, to what exactly his role was. But most people leave him out entirely. And I believe if you go to the Wikipedia page on this, he's not mentioned whatsoever. So, it, you know, it sort of speaks to the general sense of a, a lack of knowledge about what exactly Spooner did, uh, what role he played in this John Brown raid on Harper's Ferry. Could you tell us exactly what were his connections to the Secret Six? Yeah, so the Secret Six uh, refers to a group of six financiers and abolitionists uh, from the North who uh, basically provided the financial backing and a little bit of the logistic infrastructure behind John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. And uh, it's an interesting eclectic group. Uh, there are two members in particular that are friends with and very closely connected to Spooner. So there's, uh, there's the physical connection. And that's uh, Garrett Smith, who we mentioned, the, uh, uh, the wealthy abolitionist. He's one of the financiers of the, uh, the Brown scheme. And the second is more of a Massachusetts friend of Spooner, and this is a, um, a minister by the name of uh, Thomas Wentworth Higginson. Uh, he's another great classical liberal type, uh, Unitarian minister from New England, uh, ran in Spooner's circle. Spooner uh, served at his, as his attorney on a couple of different cases uh, connected to abolitionism in the, uh, the early 1850s and kind of runs in that circle. So Smith and Higginson, and four others are the, are the main financiers behind the Brown conspiracy, uh, which, as we know, famously launches a raid on the federal arsenal at uh, Harper's Ferry and uh, is actually quickly uh, suppressed by the U.S. military uh, before it, it really takes root. Uh, Brown has a fairly similar vision to Spooner of trying to incite a slave revolt um, across the South uh, being a distributor. That's why they target the arsenal is to acquire the arms and then spread them across the countryside. Uh, Brown is more radical, if you can imagine this, than Spooner in the sense that uh, he's ready to pull the trigger now, whereas Spooner's argument was always, we need instruction in the philosophy of a free society to convince people that this revolt is the right thing first. That's why Spooner is the intellectual pamphleteer. Brown is seize the arsenal and pass out the guns. Uh, and what happens is just through sheer coincidence of history, Spooner's writing these pamphlets in the late 1850s and 1858, 
Um, he's about to publish one, and he shows it to his friend, Thomas Wentworth Higginson. It says, uh, I'm about to mail this across the South. It's my new uh, abolitionist campaign. Will you take a look at it and tell me what you think? And Higginson reads it knowing what Brown is about to do, and he's kind of like, oh, crap. You're about to announce what we're, uh, uh, we're intending to launch here. So Higginson arranges for a meeting with Spooner in a coffee house in Boston, I believe it was, uh, where they have a conversation. And we only know of this through a couple of letters that reference the conversation. Uh, so he writes um, a letter to Spooner and says, uh, I've read your pamphlet. Uh, you need to come with me <laughs> effectively. Be at the coffee house at 10 a.m. this morning. I have someone you need to meet. And there's actually an encounter where, where uh, Spooner does uh, meet with John Brown and learns of the conspiracy. Uh, he doesn't jump in full-fledged as someone that can really do anything to launch the conspiracy while it, uh, it takes off, but he's aware of it and has a little bit of reservation because, again, he's the intellectual. He thinks we need to lay, lay out the intellectual case for a revolt first and foremost before we actually pull the trigger and engage in the revolt. But uh, John Brown, as we know, proceeds anyway with the Secret Six support. Spooner learns of this through the Secret Six, and he, he helps them out in two ways. The first is being an attorney. Uh, he says, you know, if any of you get into trouble with the law, I'll serve as your counsel. I'll uh, file the motions in court and uh, we'll defend you. Uh, so he goes back to his, his legal trade, his main profession, as a, uh, a mechanism to protect the secret six. Uh, the second thing he attempts to do is after Brown is captured, after Brown's imprisoned and put on trial uh, and is awaiting his execution, Spooner actually tries to devise a mercenary scheme uh, that's willing to go into the South, uh, sail up the James River into Richmond, and basically spring Brown from jail, and if not that, take a Southern official hostage effectively and use that as the trade-off uh, to spring Brown from, uh, from prison. So he sees uh, an injustice in the arrest of Brown even though he sees Brown's scheme as kind of half-baked and premature. Uh, and there are, there are several letters where he actually writes Higginson uh, devising this plan. And one of them says that uh, if we can raise enough money, if we get uh, $1,000 a piece, uh, possibly even up the, uh, the payment to 2,000, we can hire 25 mercenaries that can uh, sneak in in the middle of, uh, of night and spring Brown from prison or uh, if not do that, uh, we can actually uh, uh, force their hand by, uh, by taking someone hostage effectively. And uh, uh, actually lays out this very elaborate scheme, sends it to Higginson. Higgins, Higginson responds and is like, wait a minute, no, um, I don't think this will work because mercenaries are of notorious um, uh, low ethics. <laughs> it says well, he doesn't think that the mercenaries will stick to uh, the resolve. Basically, at the first resistance, they'll just take the money and run or flip sides and reveal it. Uh, so Spooner's kind of the hardliner. Uh, Higginson, by this point, even though he backed the, the, the Brown raid, has become a pragmatist and urges Spooner to back down from this plan so they never really launch a, uh, um, a mercenary raid uh, to free John Brown from prison. Uh, again, this is, uh, by the way, one of the things uh, why if there's any libertarian filmmakers out there, there should be a Lysander Spooner biopic is to tell the story of uh, the aborted mercenary raid to, uh, to free John Brown. Uh, so there's, the, there's one of the elements of the connection that emerges to the Secret Six, but it's, it's a rear guard action after the conspiracy has also been launched. Uh, one final thing I'll note is that in 1860, Spooner's pamphlet has been printed. It's been disseminated across the South and other areas of the country, arguing that we still need to proceed in the slave revolt. He actually continues to work in printing this thing after the Brown conspiracy. Uh, one of the uh, copies of it makes its way into the hands of the governor of Virginia, Henry Wise. Uh, when Scooter printed it, it's uh, of course anonymous. He doesn't put his name on the, uh, the copies. He just wants the plan to be out there. And uh, Governor Wise, issues kind of this public decree thinking that he's found uh, the core document that proves the Northern abolitionists are behind the Brown conspiracy and we can bring them to justice for insurrection and treason and sedition. And, uh, but, they, but he doesn't know who the author is. So he does this public announcement uh, and right after the, uh, the word of it gets into the newspapers, Spooner pulls out his pen 
and writes a letter to uh, Governor Wise and says, um, uh, dear governor, I am the person you're looking for. There is not a court in Massachusetts that would indict me for it. Uh, so try your best, come at me, is basically the message of the letter. And nothing ever really comes at it. Uh, uh, Wise backs down. Uh, and then of course the, the Civil War breaks out, so it's, it's all pushed by the wayside. Uh, but that's the, uh, the last hurrah of Spooner's contribution that has a connection to the Secret Six. Now you make me think. Uh, maybe instead of a, a biographical film, we need um, a a you know fantasy where his his uh, <laughs> escape attempt with John Brown works out, and they go to lead that slave revolt after all. <laughs> That's like a inglorious bastards of the Civil War. Exactly. Yeah, that would be that would <laughs> be very cool. History. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, now I, I wonder though, did it ever, or when was it public knowledge that he had something to do with the Brown raid? Because people, uh, I mean, people so wanted them out, all hang uh, for treason. Around 1860, there's enough conversation that you can connect them to it. Um, and again, so, so the one thing that really keeps attention away from him personally is that there are attempts to bring some of the other secret six, quote unquote, to justice. Uh, so there are attempts to prosecute them. Uh, Garrett Smith, his friend, basically ends up pleading insanity uh, to develop a legal uh, strategy to resist any attempts to uh, to prosecute him. Smith is is probably the most co uh, prominent of the Secret Six. He's a former U.S. congressman, uh, had been a national political figure, and uh, there is an actual attempt to uh, to indict him in serious, substantial ways as a collaborator of Brown. A few of the others actually flee the country uh, or flee into uh, other areas of the United States where they cannot be brought uh, under the court system. Higginson kind of bunkers down in, uh, in uh, Massachusetts uh, uh, where he, he views the local court system, which is very aligned with abolitionism, as sufficient to protect him. Uh, but Spooner himself, is at least one step removed that he doesn't attract uh, enough attention that he uh, he is personally imperiled by it, other than kind of uh, sticking the middle finger up at, uh, at Governor Wise. But by then, uh, you know, the, the country is is heading uh, headfirst into the Civil War. Uh, it, it kind of is a mooted point by the time that anyone could do anything about it. Now, at this point in the show, we have covered. <laughs> a bit too extensively, perhaps. We've we've covered contemporaries of Spooners like George Fitzhugh and Hinton Helper, who are both ic other extreme examples of of radical thinkers from the time and radical doers too, in their own way. Uh, I wonder if you could take a couple minutes to compare someone like Spooner with folks like Fitzhugh and Hinton Helper. Yeah, yeah. So probably the closest comparison is their uh, their style of disseminating their messages. All three of them are pamphleteers. They're uh, incredibly productive writers. They draw various sources of income from selling their pamphlets or uh, or putting small journalism pieces out in magazines that they get paid for. Uh, and they're relative contemporaries, so they live in about the same period. Uh, fits you, of course, being the radical pro-slavery um, advocate that tries to extend the slave system to the entire society. He sees this as an ordering system for society. But his approach is is very similar. He writes two book-length pamphlets, uh, Sociology for the South and Cannibals All, that are arguing his case. He disseminates them not only across the South but into the North. Uh, so one of the things Fitzhugh does, uh, he, he's actually famous of the pro-slavery theorists of being the one guy that's willing to actually go to the North and debate the abolitionists. And he does, uh, I believe it's in 1855, he travels up to the North and uh, in, engages in an exchange with both Garrett Smith and Wendell Phillips, who's another Boston-based abolitionist, a uh, very public exchange. Uh, Spooner in the sense is kind of like the uh, the foil to that. He's the Northern abolitionist that's very willing to send his material South or foment the slave revolt in the South as we just talked about. Um, so stylistically, there's a, there's a bit of similarity. Uh, this taps into a, uh, an older lost art of, um, of social action that uh, we no longer see today, the pamphleteer uh, 
uh, or it's morphed into other things. I guess they do it on blogs and Twitter today or something uh, would be the closest parallel. But uh, you have intellectual figures that aren't necessarily connected to a specific institution like a university or a, um, a research outfit, but nonetheless engage in legal theorizing or political theorizing or social theorizing and they take their message to other intellectuals in the form of pamphlets and very elaborate, sophisticated arguments in pamphlets. Uh, so both Spooner and Fitzhugh do that. Hinton, Rowan, Helfer, uh, very similar case. He's a Southerner by birth that views slavery as an evil of society. He's, he views it as a, a wrong that exists around him, and he blames it for some of the economic malaise that afflicts the South, the lack of industrialization. but He's also much more wedded to a, um, a racial vision of uplift for the white man. Uh, so Hinton Rowan Helper is effectively what we would call a, a radical colonizationist. He wants uh, the blacks freed, but then he wants them moved off the continent. And his whole motive for doing this is much more rooted in, he thinks slavery is inflicting a wrong economically on free white Southerners, the poor whites of the South. Uh, than he uh, than the, the blacks themselves that are affected by slavery, even though he does believe it's a wrong, it's an injustice to them, but uh, the racial motive is more aligned with his own class, his own group, than with uh, the actual victims of slavery itself. Uh, but he, again, he's a pamphleteer, and he's also someone that's willing to take his case across the country. He moves to the North, he publishes his material in the North, and then sends it South, uh, and causes all sorts of rage and, uh, and backlash from the slave owners that he's attacking. Uh, so the style is very similar between these three figures. Uh, what does differ is that Spooner has a more enduring intellectual legacy because he's not just an anti-slavery theorist. He's not just wedded to the issue of slavery. He's actually articulating a full philosophy of human liberty. And slavery just happens to be the, uh, the big issue of the 20 or so odd year period that he's uh, uh, at the height of his political uh, writing and the height of his political philosophizing. But uh, you can take a Spooner pamphlet on monetary policy from the 1870s or a Spooner pamphlet on theories of government from the 1880s. You can find the same themes of human liberty in an appeal to natural rights that you'd find in an 1840 or 1850 pamphlet that he wrote against slavery. So there's a universal dimension that's not present in these other guys, unless you want to call Fitzhugh kind of like a, a forerunner to the alt-right, which I actually think there is some case for through uh, the Carlylean connections he has. But uh, the uh, someone like Spooner is a much broader thinker than just slavery alone, even though he's as radical as one can get short of John Brown on the slavery issue. You know, a, a couple other things strike me. They all three make explicit class appeals, right? But but Spooner's is clearly the classical liberal version of class, that the government is the great exploiter and the mass of humanity is its victim. Um, and the other, the other two are not so concerned about it like that. Um, and it, it's interesting too that both Fitzhugh and Spooner have politics that are terribly unpopular and ineffective. But Hinton Helper and his uh, sort of xenophobic populism is very, very popular politically. Uh, but yet both him and Fitzhugh die in obscurity and Spooner, like you said, is the only one who leaves a genuine intellectual remnant. You know, he, he leaves a circle of followers and admirers around somebody like Benjamin Tucker who just absolutely adore his legacy. Um, and you know that that seems intensely important to me as a way of linking uh, Spooner very directly to the modern libertarian libertarian movement that we know. Um, and I wonder if then you could close us off by telling us about your current project uh, working with Lysander right. Spooner. <laughs> right. So, so uh, as I mentioned, you know, Spooner does not go away after the Civil War. And in fact, other than his anti-slavery uh, treatise on constitutionality of slavery, he's probably best known today for this little pamphlet that uh, uh, goes by the name of No Treason or the Constitution of No Authority. And this is his reflection on what the Civil War has done to the constitutional order. He's perfectly happy that slavery has ended, but he's asking the question, at what expense socially did the route we take to ending it 
um, accomplish uh, that end. Uh, so he's very concerned that uh, basically that the state, the government, which had been the enabler of slavery since time immemorial, is now suddenly taking credit for freeing the slaves because uh, just through chance of the way that this war turned out, it became a political convenience for them to do it. So that's his big message. Uh, so again, anti-statism is present. He sees the state as a mechanism of social ill. What he does after the war, though, uh, in addition to continuing to extend this political philosophy in an individualist, anarchistic direction, he also turns to economic matters. And my current project, which is a book we're just releasing uh, uh, this month uh, through the American Institute for Economic Research, uh, it's going to be on our, our, um, our classic reprint series. Um, I located and found a series of pamphlets that Spooner wrote in 1876 through roughly 1877, so about a, a two-year period um, in the late 19th century, where he lays out a very complex monetary theory of uh, basically introducing monetary monetary competition against that great monopolist that's the source of all social ills, the United States government. Uh, so he sees the federal government as a continuation of this monopolistic tradition he's been fighting all his life. So 1840, the government monopolized uh, the postal system. Uh, since time immemorial, the, the government had monopolized the labor system by instituting slavery and giving it legal sanction. After the Civil War, he says, government monopolizes the production and issuance of currency. And what happens in this pamphlet is he lays out an elaborate theory for what we might consider like 19th century Bitcoin. Uh, he wants private actors to be able to, uh, to issue competitive currencies of their own and basically tie these to better products than what the federal government is able to offer. So he sees the federal government as prone to political manipulation of its currency, to debt finance what it wants to do, and the victims are always the holder of that currency. So uh, society at large is deprived of an economic say in its main monetary instrument because the federal government has monopolized it and turned it toward these corrupt and uh, uh, economically susceptible political ends. So it's almost public choice theory, early public choice theory meets radical monetary competition. And what Spooner did is in 1876 is he began publishing this series of monetary tracts um, in a magazine that was edited by one of his friends in, in the Boston area. It's called The New Age. Uh, the editor was a, um, a fellow intellectual by the uh, name of uh, uh, J. Uh, M. L. Babcock. Uh, ran in the same circles as Spooner and Tucker, and ended up putting together a very sophisticated economic doctrine that uses the historical example of Scottish free banking. So anyone that studied uh, the monetary project at Cato, you probably know and have heard about Scottish free banking. Spooner does a historical analysis of Scottish free banking. and says, this is our model for, for introducing monetary competition into the United States, and basically lays out a theory of, uh, of how it would work and how it would solve some of the credit crises that had uh, caused uh, economic depressions and recessions in his own day, the big one being the panic of 1873. So he wrote this pamphlet. It was known in his day. It's cited in several newspapers. But after Spooner died, it uh, kind of fell by the wayside. And it was believed for many, many years that the only existing copy of this pamphlet uh, belonged to um, his mentee and protege, Benjamin Tucker. Well, Tucker inherited Spooner's papers from his estate and kept them for many years to try and keep that torch alive. But Tucker had a very unfortunate incident right after the, uh, the turn of the 20th century. He owned a bookstore where he kept all of his massive collection of pamphlets and uh, 19th century uh, legal individualistic anarchism, including Spooner's papers and the bookstore went up in flames. There was a fire that destroyed his collection. So uh, it's always been thought that this pamphlet, uh, this great monetary tract that we knew in other references, had been lost to history. And what it turns out to be is that a few surviving copies of this newspaper he serialized it in for uh, did manage to make it through the ages although they're in incomplete form. So there's no single library in the United States that has a full run of this, this newspaper called The New Age. 
And what I did is I went through and I found all the different library collections that had bits and pieces of the new age and pieced back together the serialized form. Uh, so now we have a 200 page Lysander Spooner uh, treatise on free banking uh, and competitive currency uh, that basically lays out his theory of how that type of a system would work. And we're putting it back into print for the first time since 1876. Phil Magnus is Senior Research Fellow at the American Institute for Economic Research. And definitely keep your eyes out for his latest book on Lysander Spooner, Two Treatises on Competitive Currency and Banking. Liberty Chronicles is a project of libertarianism.org. It is produced by Tess Terrible. If you've enjoyed this episode of Liberty Chronicles, please rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes. For more information on Liberty Chronicles, visit libertarianism.org.